Binational Training Program. Today we have Dr. Dominic Yong and Dr. Joanne Bryan presenting from Melbourne RSCP. A reminder to all connections to please keep the microphones muted and cameras blocked. If uh, any questions will be answered at the end, I'll now hand it over to Dr. Dominic Yong. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, Terry. Uh, what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna be having a chat with you about um, assessing work capacity. About the whys, the whats, the hows, we're gonna run through a couple of case studies so that we can put the theory into practice. And at the end, uh, Technology Willing will also do a bit of a quiz. Um, now, my name's Dominic Yong and I'm a uh, doctor, I'm an occupational physician from Melbourne, um, sitting or standing in the Melbourne um, RACP offices. Not many people here, but I understand that there's a number of you out there remotely. Uh, what I thought I might just do first is just to tell you a bit about occupational medicine and why we do capacity for work. Uh, you probably have some sort of understanding that um, occupational physicians, yes, we are a member of a faculty such as yourselves as uh, rehab physicians or rehab physician trainees, a faculty of the um, RACP. Uh, occupational medicine really is the, uh, the specialty where we are dealing uh, with the, the health of an individual and the workplace and really the interaction between the workplace and, and its effect on the individual and vice versa, the individual effect on the workplace. You probably don't see a lot of us because um, we're not actually hospital, hospital based. Uh, so our training program and our fellows uh, don't work in the public hospital system. So you probably find a lot of us in private clinics, which could be uh, doctor run or run by corporates. Uh, you find some of us working in uh, government organisations uh, such as WorkSafe or down in Victoria, we have the medical panels where some of us would work. Uh, some of us would work directly in industry. So some of the larger employers such as in oil and gas uh, would have their own health and safety team of which an occupational physician would be part of it. And you just generally see us around the workplace. So if you were to see us in a public hospital, we wouldn't be seeing patients, inpatients or outpatients, but we're likely to be uh, down assessing with workers in the kitchen or the security department, the maintenance department, something like that. So, so briefly, just to give you an idea about sort of a bit of a day in the life. So just got a couple of uh, pictures here. Now, the first one, yes, we are physicians. Um, we're occupational physicians. So we sit in a, a room with a desk and a computer and we have examination couches and we sort of know how to use some of the equipment. Uh, the top uh, photograph is the uh, we're a standard workplace. So this is a uh, food manufacturer uh, that we would be in there assessing various aspects of it. And uh, the other one was really just to show you a picture of um, how we train. So this is a, uh, a photo of the occupational physician trainees uh, in Victoria doing a training session. And this is at one of the manufacturers called CSL. So. I noticed with the rehab physicians, you seem to have a training program where you're all remote and you're logging in, or maybe some of you are sitting in office together. Uh, we sort of get out to industry. So, but getting back to the issue, capacity for work. Now, why do we do it? Um, I suppose, you know, when you entered medicine and maybe when you entered your, uh, you know, your chosen profession, you know, there are probably a few reasons why you did it. You, you may have done it because you enjoyed diagnosing conditions or perhaps you enjoyed treating um, people or having you know, conversations with individuals. But I'm guessing that none of you really chose it because you wanted to assess capacity for work. And even as occupational physicians, we're probably the same. So when we talk about, well, why do we assess capacity for work? And I think really the answer comes down to because we are really asked to do it commonly by a third party. So, and if you think about the capacity of work, we're doing it because our patient, if we can do this well, accesses a system or accesses treatment, accesses compensation. And so when we talk about it, we commonly, it's a third party reason why we assess capacity for work. Uh, 
you may also have you know legal reasons or it may also be your gp who can't or doesn't feel confident doing it and is wishing to have some form of input as to why they um, um to give you some sort of a i suppose support to the gp as to when they're determining capacity for work and i've given a few examples of uh, when you would be assessing work capacity and i suppose the most common example is just the standard medical certificate um, and i've listed a few others from there so the question is well we sort of know why we do uh, why we assess work capacity the next question is well how how do we do it how do we assess work capacity and and Really with work capacity, it sort of comes down to that basic premise of occupational medicine where you have the individual and you have the workplace because, you know, commonly we're sort of very focused as doctors on doing the individual stuff, the, the history, the examination, the investigations, getting an understanding of the diagnosis. And, and that's fine, that gives us some idea about the capacity, but, but really for the assessing work capacity, the other part of the equation is you sort of need to know a bit about the job and so you need to assess the person's uh, workplace. And um, if, so therefore, once we have that as a general principle, uh, the question is then, well, what do we do? And what I thought I'd do is uh, just to run through sort of with you, just a, a bit of an example about, uh, perhaps we just choose an example of someone with, you know, chronic low back pain and sort of what do we do? Well, the, the first thing is that we assess the worker and, we do the things that we are taught in medical schools. We take a history. And what do we want to know about this person with chronic low back pain? I mean, I don't want to sort of, again, teach you how to suck eggs, but it's really the common sort of scenario. How did it begin? And what's the clinical course? And what treatment have they had along the way? And what effects that had? You might want to, on the history, get some idea about their, their function. So what impact this has had on the individual? Um, what can they do? What can't they do? You would also want to do an examination. And I suppose when you're doing that clinical assessment, the history and examination, for an example, like uh, with chronic low back pain, is uh, you're trying to identify well, a few things. One is to exclude any sort of red flag conditions because any red flag conditions, such as, you know, the tumours, the infections, those sorts of things, obviously need a different um, plan of management. Also, you're trying to get an understanding whether it could be a condition where they would need to um, have, I suppose, more interventional treatment or more active treatment. So, so if you, on the history of the examination, you're determining they have a radiculopathy or something which is neurocompressive, that would encourage you to refer your patient, you know, to a neurosurgeon or, or your specialist down that pathway. After we do that, then, you know, we want to get further information about the injured worker. Uh, we do investigations. But then on top of that, there's other information that uh, may provide you with some, in, uh, provide you with some information about their work capacity. So documentation, I suppose I'm referring to sort of medical reports from specialists. I mean, other information, there's, there's other reports which can come from, you know, treating physiotherapists, you know, occupational rehabilitation providers, functional capacity evaluations which give you a very good idea about uh, their level of function but you know quite time consuming and and if you've had much experience with them uh, not many people get them due to their i suppose their cost and the, the time involved but really what you're trying to do is to you know get an understanding of the diagnosis firstly because with diagnosis comes following you know i suppose more information such as the natural history the prognosis you know, what treatment you would be recommending for the individual. Uh, you also would be trying to get an understanding of their level of function. So because diagnosis is not enough, it's also what impact it has on them. And also if they're having medical treatment, what impact the medical treatment has on them. So for example, you know, the person with chronic low back pain and is taking, you know, daily non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, well, you know, there's a good chance they might get a gut ache. Um, people who are on high dose narcotics have their own side effects from that. So the next thing after you've in assessed the individual, we're now looking at the workplace. 
And this is where I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on, and I suppose this is something that we all enjoy talking about as occupational physicians. So the first thing is to get an understanding of their job title. Um, and it's not rocket science asking them exactly, you know, what they do. And they'll often tell you a job title, but commonly that's not enough. And um, sort of reflecting about this, probably in the last six months, I've seen um, three people who said they are maintenance coordinators and I asked them what they did. So the first one said, well, I'm a maintenance coordinator. I work at the local TAFE. My job is to look at or to ensure that the, I suppose, the plant and the equipment on the TAFE are being maintained. But what I do is I call in the contractors. I ensure the contractors come on site. They're inducted and I take them out on site. I look at their work. I schedule the work appropriately. In other words, this maintenance coordinator really has a sedentary type role. Um, the second person I asked uh, was a maintenance coordinator at an aged care facility, uh, which is quite a large aged care facility. And again, he had part of that role as well, organising contractors in, like for you know, the large scale air conditioning systems or whatever. But his role was also to ensure that any minor jobs were were dealt with. So if uh, you needed to change, you know, the, uh, uh, the light fittings, the doorknob needed fix, fixing, and he would do that. So he worked on a bit of the tools and he'd need to, you know, carry his tools around and he had a ladder. But he also had a sedentary or an office-based component. And the third one was a maintenance coordinator and, and he worked in sort of reasonably sort of heavy industry. There's a big manufacturing plant and he was called a maintenance coordinator because he had a staff member with him. And so he was sort of like a supervisor. But he would say he worked on the tools. So if uh, his role was to make sure the machines kept going, there was a preventative maintenance uh, program where he would need to maintain the machines um, on a regular basis. But when the machines broke down, his job was to make sure they got going straight away. So that would be, he and his colleague would be in and out of machines, they'd be climbing in and out, they would potentially be taking motors apart, they'd be using you know, large tools that have to potentially carry some of the motors, could weigh 50 kilograms, two of them onto a trolley, wheel it back to their, their uh, workshop and work on it and bring it back and install it. So we're talking about significant manual handling requirements. So, so we can say the job title gives us some information, but really going beyond that and asking what they do, the occupational history gives you even more. You can also get uh, more information from documents. Uh, you can, if you've been involved in a bit of workers' compensation, occupational rehabilitation providers would write up about um, their job. Some physios would go on site and give you an idea about their, the job or ergonomists as well. And sometimes there are videos, some employers will take videos of certain jobs or certain production lines and send them to you. And they're also good to, to look at as well. But the last one, and I suppose the best one is called the work site assessment. And this is what we as occupational physicians are trained to do, but there's really no reason why um, other doctors uh, shouldn't be doing this as well. And when we're talking about trying to understand a situation and we talk about, you compare a report or words, and compare a picture and they say the picture is worth a thousand words um, but you can then look at a picture or you can actually go out to the workplace and do the experience you can not only look at how they're doing it in real time you can also pick up their tools you can have a go you can work out in your own mind what the requirements of the role are so that is really invaluable as to uh, what information that brings to the table when you're determining capacity for work. So if you get a chance to do a workplace assessment, go ahead. Sometimes um, the other way to do it is if you were to uh, some of our occupational physician conferences, so the RACP, um, run through the RACP, or there's also an organisation uh, that's called ANZSOM, which stands for the Australasian Society of Occupational Medicine. Uh, whenever they we run our annual uh, conferences, we'd also have a worksite assessment component. And so we get out to various industries. And just to give a bit of a plug, so there is one in Melbourne in October, the Anzom Conference, and they'd be going out to industries 
I think they're going to, for example, like the police uh, training centre. Uh, they'd be going to manufacturing plants, which make, I think, food. And so there's various others. So it's a good opportunity, uh, a good way to get an understanding about what people do. So you're out there and you're assessing the workplace and the job. And so this is where you're trying to get an understanding what they do, you're there to have an understanding of their environment, you ask them about what their role is, you know, run us through a standard day, run us through a non-standard day, you know, some people when they, um, they'll say, well, pretty much for 95% of the time, this is what I do, but then when the machine breaks down, and then we have to take everything off the conveyor belt, and it, we're taking off one tonne every 30 minutes, and then when the conveyor belt restarts, we have to put that one tonne back on. So, you know, ask those sort of questions. Uh, work out, you know, what sort of shifts you do. Uh, some people do fixed shifts, some people do rotating shifts, some tasks are done differently on different shifts, depending on the operational demands. Again, working out their working hours, which also could be when do you start, when do you finish, and um, how do they attend work as well? Because um, in this day and age, some people do have significant commutes to get to work, and this may be a reason why they can or can't go back to work earlier or later after surgery. So now you've done the two bits. You've seen the worker, you've assessed the worker, then you've seen the job and you assess the job and now it's time to make a uh, decision. And this is where you have to decide, well, do they have a capacity, don't they have a capacity? And a lot of people do get a bit uh, confused or, or a bit hesitant making that call. Now you can, uh, one thing we often talk about with our trainees is you try to, don't reinvent the wheel, there are existing medical standards around. Now I did bring one in, but I don't know whether I've got the video on, Terence, but um, I don't know whether you can video this, I'm going to hold it up, but it's the assessing fitness to drive for the commercial and, ve and private vehicle drivers. And this standard gives good information looking at medical conditions about whether there's a capacity to do it sort of unrestricted or restricted and gives you a bit of information to base your decision on. Essentially, it's about making a call, justifying decision and giving your reasons. And when we talk about this, we, we would often say, you've got really one of three options. The first option, you, you've got the worker and front of you and you've got an understanding of their job and they are clearly fit to do the job. So they've got some medical condition, it's resolved, it's a lot better. The requirements of the role are significant with manual handling, so they're clearly fit to do that job. Then on the other end of the spectrum, it might be something where they're clearly unfit to work. And the common scenarios would be, you know, soon after surgery, you know, you've had someone's had their hernia repair done, they're one or two weeks down the track, um, you know, their level of function is still limited. They've got a significant manual handling in their role or a significant commute or something like that. They're clearly unfit. But in the middle is that what we call the gray zone where we sort of say, well, you know, are they fit? Are they unfit? Well, perhaps they are. And so this is where um, the gray zone is where we encourage you to think about that because for the grey zone, this is where we talk about adjustments in the workplace or accommodations or modifications or some form of restrictions. And as, as a treating doctor, you, you really have the option, and certainly in the workers' comp field or, and certainly in other fields, is to give some sort of idea about what sort of restrictions or accommodations. Because really the employer can and may, it depends on their own, um, and it's their own choice, the employer. They can restrict certain tasks or duties. You know, you can also um, have people where they can be accommodated in different work locations. So, for example, an employer um, may have multiple sites. So, an example could be to say like a, a supermarket, for example, but the individual worker works at a supermarket, one of the major brands, you know, one hour away. But sometimes the employer may say, well, to improve you know, to encourage a return to work, we can offer a location close to the, close to the individual's home. It, the, you can also um, accommodate or restrict, you know, hours per week, 
types of shifts can be uh, something that you can also look at as well. So, and I, in my previous role, I was the uh, the occupational physician at um, CSL, and we had a lot of workers doing rotating 12-hour shifts. So they do two 12-hour day shifts, two 12-hour night shifts, and then four shifts off. And we had a few people who um, had issues with medical conditions and returning back to that rotating shifts. And, and you know, you've got medical conditions such as you know, insulin and the diabetes or diabetics, when do they take their, um, their insulin and their oral hypoglycemics or they're eating at different times. Uh, we also had people who had sleep issues and of course it was, um, they were struggling with that rotating shift pattern. And also with this gray zone, you can also talk about, you know, medical treatment, you know, they are fit to return to work dependent on accessing some form of medical treatment. And uh, one common one example could be, you know, the truck driver who's falling asleep at the wheel and really has obstructive sleep apnea. And he should be on a CPAP machine because he's been to a sleep lab and has been diagnosed. And, and when he's on the CPAP machine, um, his symptoms are certainly manageable. And, and that's an example where you may say this person can return to work. And the other one is also the regular review. So when you say someone's fit to work, you, you know, you can say that and off you go and you don't see them again, but you can also ensure that there's a regular review. You are, there is a capacity to return to this job that this person needs to be reviewed every month or two months or three months for the first year. And then you make a decision after that. So let's, move from the theory of it all you've we talked about the theory of it all and um we're gonna just go through a couple of case studies just to sort of get a feel for how we approach this so i'll introduce you to luke uh, luke's a young man he's just got into the workforce uh still trying to stay fit so he's still playing uh hockey and he has a fall and injures his shoulder, right shoulder. Uh, his scan shows an acute rupture of the supraspinatus and he goes off to the surgeon. Surgeon says you need an operation and he's had this two months ago. So he's now sitting there in front of you. He's otherwise well. Uh, Post-operatively, he's just started seeing a physio. He's got a bit of discomfort. He's taking four to six panadine tablets per week. And when you examine him, there's some reduction in some of the movements. But he is otherwise doing fine. So, again, the first question is what do we do? Uh, well, when we're talking about his capacity for work or planning to return to work, we ask him what he does. He says he's an engineer. So, what do we do now? So, you're going to now take an occupational history of Luke. So in terms of Luke, Luke tells you that he works at a manufacturing company. He works in a team of other engineers, works office hours, sits at a computer, uses, does CAD drawings, goes to meetings. It's pretty much office based. He says he does drive to work. So I suppose when we're, and, and again, you don't have the, the full history of the the worker and the job, but I suppose the question is, well, what information that you've been able to glean from this brief history would impact on Luke's capacity for work? So, and I suppose I've started off with a bit of an easy case here, because really when we look at his job, there's not a lot of significant manual handling here. So, um, so really, once he gets to work, um, we're not terribly concerned. We could ensure that he has an ergonomic assessment to see that he's not reaching too much with his mouse or his keyboard. We can do that. But really the issues with this guy is he's driving to work. How long is he driving? Is it a 10 minute drive? Is it a one hour drive? Um, this soon after shoulder surgery, the, the driving tolerances I would expect to be um, lower than normal. He's also taking some medication, so that could be impacting on his, you know, his bit of codeine, might impact on his concentration or things like that. But really there's nothing um, much there. So what I'm gonna do now, um, I was hoping we could have a discussion about this, but uh, there's not many in the room here. 
I'm going to run through a couple of scenarios where I just want you to have a think about it uh, yourself. I'm going to read through the, the scenarios. And really what we've got here is we've got Luke. Luke's medical condition is unchanged, okay? So he's still the, the guy who's had shoulder surgery two months ago. And in scenario two and three, he's still an engineer. But scenario two, Luke's an engineer and he works for a software development company. And really with this uh, company, he, you know, he works from home a bit. He goes into the office and hot desks. And for those who don't know about hot desking, it's basically where there's a whole lot of workstations there. And on a first come, first serve, you sit wherever you want and you set yourself up. Because of the nature of his work, he also travels um, a fair bit and uh, you tend to find that some of the uh, uh, younger guys in the company, those without um, young kids, uh, tend to put their hand up for doing a lot of travel to uh, Southeast Asia or overseas. So he does three to four trips a year, uh, does three to four trips per quarter, sorry. So he's traveling a lot. Each trip, maybe one week, probably no more than two weeks. So he's sort of in and out of uh, the country. And so I was going to ask you then, what are some of the issues there that um, would imp impact on his capacity for work? And then scenario three is, is also an engineer again, this time's for a mining company. And so he's a, a FIFO worker on, on an 8-6 roster. Uh, so for those, who, again, who don't know FIFO, fly in, fly out. An 8-6 roster means that you fly in for eight days and then you come out for six days. And um, historically, they used to be seven day on, seven day off. But what used to happen was the team would fly in for seven days. Then the team which was there would fly out on that same plane going out. And so there was really no formal handover system. So a lot of the mining companies for um, safety reasons, uh, the team which has just flown in and the team which has just flown out, they overlap by one day. And so that's why they now have a thing called an eight, six roster. So they have one day where they can do a handover. And so he's flying from Perth to the, to the site in Outback WA. Uh, when he's on site, he says he does a bit of office based duties, but in his department, they're required to ensure the integrity of the steel track um, of the vehicles carrying the, um, the stuff they're mining out. And he uses an ultrasound machine. So again, Without history, you know, what information above would impact on uh, Luke's capacity for work? Um, now, ordinarily, I would uh, give everyone in the room five minutes to work on this case study, um, but I don't think we've got, we can do that. So we'll just have a talk about uh, scenario two. So scenario two, we still have the same old Luke and we still have the issue that he's driving into work. So we still have, um, that is an issue which could impact on his capacity. How far is he driving? And we still have the issue with his medication as well. Now, the other thing is when he hot desks and he goes in, he's got to carry his laptop in. And he tells me that he carries, you know, a laptop and he carries his own keyboard and his own mouse and his portable hard drive and his portable charger for his phone and his cables. And, and, um, he sort of his backpack and he's got his lunch and he's got the other stuff and his backpack can weigh a fair bit. So obviously that may impact on his capacity. In terms of um, traveling overseas and uh, so, you know, traveling overseas, the, the issue really is about luggage. And you probably find that traditionally some people who would go overseas would have to check in luggage and so their luggage could be 10, 15 kilograms and they've got to handle that all the way from just say home into the airport. So it could be carry luggage out of the bedroom, into the car, drive to the airport, get it out of the car, wheel it, put it onto the, the check-in um, counter and then reverse the process at their destination to get into the hotel. But now people don't check in uh, as much. And so, you know, you're trying to avoid that so you can walk off from the airport straight away. But therefore also means that that um, wheelerboard you've got has got a bit of weight to it. And uh, where does the wheelerboard go? But in the plane, but in the overhead compartment. And so someone who's got a shoulder condition may struggle putting their uh, wheelerboard above shoulder height. And that could be done depending on where they're going. It could be a couple of legs on the trip. So 
So you need to think about that and workshop that with um, Luke. In terms of the, uh, the third scenario, uh, I suppose what things would impact on his capacity for work? So, you know, we've still got the, uh, uh, the medication as an issue. In fact, the medication is more of an issue here because uh, when someone's on um, panadine and that's a codeine medication, you may find that quite a few uh, mines have a, um, have a strong drug and alcohol policy and some of them may do this randomly and some of them may do testing before, before entry onto site. So codeine would not be a great thing to be, um, to, for Luke to be taking, to be working in this sort of uh, environment. So as a doctor, you'd strongly encourage him to get off the panadine and to swap off to plain old paracetamol. Uh, again, this guy's traveling on an 8.6 roster. So we still have the same issue with luggage, um, checking in or overhead bins. Uh, the other thing is when he's on site, sometimes they may be required to climb into vehicles and some of these vehicles um, have a bit of a ladder type system to climb into. And again, if you've done a shoulder, uh, trying to climb up a ladder can be a bit problematic. And you know, we often talk about when we climb into a cabin and we're going up steps or a ladder or we've got grab rails to hang on to, there's a, there's a rule about three points of contact and that's three points of contact between the individual and the, the vehicle. And so uh, when we say point of contact, that's could be left arm, right arm, left leg or right leg. So generally your right arm in Luke's case would need to get to or around above shoulder height to be climbing up ladders. So that can present an issue. Uh, the other one is the ultrasound machine. And so uh, the ultrasound machine does weigh about 10 kilograms. It is on wheels, but again, it is bulky to handle. So that would be, um, uh, that would be uh, another thing that you need to take into account. All right, so now we're going quite well here for time because we didn't have time to workshop this case. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to move on to a quiz. Now, what I'd like you to do out there in the regions is to get your phone out. Just follow the instructions on uh, point one and point two. And I'll give you a couple of seconds to go to that website. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to swap the screen to the game. Okay, all right, so you should be asked to enter a game pin number. So if you can enter that pin number and then it'll take you to another screen where you'll get to enter your name and potentially just, if you don't mind entering your name, maybe even put your region where you're from, like, you know, Vic or NZ or whatever. And I'll, I'll see how many people will join the game. Commonly when I, I do some of these talks, I would do a quiz at the end. Generally people are in the room with me when I do the quiz. It's a good way to hand out chocolate and lollies. Keeps people um, entertained, especially in the afternoon session. Uh, but I was having a chat with my teenage sons and they, they told me in general that quizzes were boring, except they told me to go to this website and to um, run a quiz this way. So all right, we're going to give this a go. We've I've done a couple. This is the first time I've done it remotely. So I'm um, assuming that if you don't have great internet access, you won't go so well. Because what's going to happen is when I start the game, which I'll give you a couple more seconds because people are still joining it, uh, you will be given a question 
and then you'll be asked to pick the answer from one of four choices. And you are marked, obviously, for correct answers, and you'll get marks based on timing as well. Now, I can see from my end that the, uh, the numbers are st still, start, still going up. All right, it looks like we've got 47 people. So the questions are based loosely on capacity for work and, um, and about workplaces. Okay, we've got to 48. I'm going to give you another 10 more seconds and then we'll start the game. So use your phone and give your answer and you can see on the left there is a countdown clock. Are you playing? Are you playing? Yep, good. All right, excellent. Most people got that correct. Okay, let's go to the next one. So yes, that was a, for those who didn't get it correct, the commercial dishwasher. So let's, all right, and so as you can see, you'll get marked based on a correct score as well as timing as well. Okay, so um, yes, that's, I'll let you know, that is, that's yarn that they're making, so it's not noodles, as some people thought. Well done, CC. All right, next question. Okay, excellent. Yes, yeah, so that's your posty, as uh, most of you got that correct. And so the posty would spend half their day uh, putting mail into those slots, and every slot represents a delivery point, or, or could be your house. And that's in the order that the posty uh, travels down the street. So, um, Okay, excellent. Right, loosely based on capacity for work, this question. All right, I can see we have Scrabble players, so fantastic. And CC still in front. All right, a few more questions to go.
Okay, yeah, well done. So this guy um, is wearing the classical gear of a painter and he's painting a car spoiler. How we do there? Okay, all right. Enough of you uh, watching Bob the Builder. Well done. All right. Okay, all right, I'll put the picture up again. Uh, so this is a, a common thing called a compactor. So you see the guys putting a whole lot of uh, cardboard boxes into the, uh, the opening there. And the top of the machine, uh, you might see a few pipes, they sort of press down the, uh, the blue horizontal plate and it pushes it down to create a bale of uh, cardboard. So you, you might see this at a few manufacturing places. Uh, also seen, um, uh, other places where they do a lot of uh, waste cardboard, such as supermarkets, out the back of supermarkets. All right, and all right, CC still in front. Okay, all right, we have one more question. Okay, and excellent again, most of you got that correct. So really uh, the point of the, uh, the, uh, the quiz was to just give you a bit of an idea about some of the jobs. It seems like most of, a lot of you have an understanding of it anyway, but uh, the more that you get out there and the more you learn about it, then I suppose the whole intent was to uh, get you to develop the skills to develop that capacity for work assessment. Now, Really, that's all finished. So um, I'm now happy to answer any questions if people have any questions. I don't know whether Terence, you're there. Yep. 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 So just um, I'm happy to answer questions if people have questions from the regions. Questions, please type them in the chat. I'll announce them on your behalf. Uh, sorry, you were just breaking up there. I don't under, didn't understand what you said. So someone has asked, how do we refer to occupational physician? Sure. Uh, you'd refer the same way you refer to any other doctor out there. Um, you'd write a referral. Uh, in terms of finding us, if you go on to the RACP, um, I think there is a find a consultant link on the web page. Uh, you can find us that way. And uh, generally we are, we would be uh, happy to provide assistance for really, uh, when we talk about occupational medicine, it's really, yeah, it could be capacity for work. Uh, we do rehabilitation, treatment, uh, workplace assessments, ergonomics, there's a whole lot of stuff that we are, would be happy to do. Uh, but yeah, you find us through that um, link through there. So if you go to the, and again, I don't have the website, uh, the address in front of me, but if you go to the RACP, Maybe if you Google RACP, um, occupational physician, find consultant or something, it might come up. I have another question. Have you had any experience with return to work for stroke patient? Uh, yes or no answer, yes. Was there anything in particular? 
Um, that, that was the, that was the question. Someone okay. else has also asked, "What did you mean by medical standard for ASSX RTW?" And you referred to Australian road guidelines. Yeah, sure. Are you able to show um, the video of me? I was, I brought in the booklet, so I can. Can you um do that, and I can hold the booklet yep. up so that they can. So on your laptop, if you just um, press stop share. Let's stop share. Yep. Yep, everyone can see you now. Uh, they can see me now? Okay. So there's this booklet here called Assessing Fitness to Drive for Commercial and Private Vehicle Drivers. So this gives you a pretty good um, outline how to approach um, assessing someone's uh, capacity for work. This predominantly talks about uh, the workplace is someone who's a commercial driver, but you can apply some of those similar standards to other workplaces as well. And so you can look through the booklet and just say you had uh, diabetes, then you look up under diabetes and it tells you for insulin dependent diabetic, um, some recommendations or um, diet controlled diabetes, um, again, different recommendations. But yeah, that booklet there, that, that's something which a lot of the uh, OC physician trainees would refer to, that's a common um, guideline for um, when they're determining capacity for work. Another question, other than return to driving standards, are there any other commonly used guidelines nationally? Uh, yeah, there are. Uh, they're quite specific. So, for example, the fire brigade will have theirs. Uh, pilots would have one. Some companies make their own. Uh, when I was at CSL, we had some other, um, uh, our own sort of internal guidelines. So, yeah, we... A lot of it is modelled on this, train drivers as well. I think it, the train driver guidelines are very similar to the commercial vehicle drivers guidelines. You tend to find the people who are assisting on the team writing these were also co-opted onto other uh, teams writing the other guidelines. But you can get this, uh, this is also uh, freely available on the net. So again, if you Google that, you should be able to download the PDF and navigate it that way. Uh, number one, someone has asked, how does he discern malingering patients, people he suspects don't want to return to work, but have been referred to him? All right. Um, as a general principle, we, my experience would be the 99, well, number one, we don't like to use the word malingering. 99% of people, um, we don't tend to have so much of an issue with return to work. One thing you're trying to uh, identify is motivation and commitment, because really for a successful return to work, and it doesn't matter which field you're in, which is workers' comp or non-workers' comp or any other field, you're looking at the commitment from the individual and you have a commitment from the employer. And once you have a commitment from both, you can move forward. And once you don't have that, then that's when you, you have troubles. There is no test. If you're looking for a test, there is no test for that. And I know that um, in our field, there's, again, if you get down that medical legal field, there's a whole lot of people who write certain things about workers. And we don't tend to use that word. We might talk about unconscious biases or things along those sort of lines, or people have a bit demotivated or de-skilled or things like that, but you probably find the the word malingering is, um, uh, is I suppose, out of date now. So someone also asked, is occupational physician service Medicare covered? Uh, some are. We do have a Medicare item number. It depends on the occupational physician who you refer to, whether they're um, happy to accept that. It's a bit like if you refer to an orthopaedic surgeon, they'll set their own prices. Uh, but yes, the occupational physicians do have a Medicare item number that they can use, or in the workers' compensation field, there's an item number again. So the answer is yes. How effective do you find FCE effective in RTW? Is it something that you would recommend for most funded points? And then also, what is your experience with RTW for severe head injury PTS? Okay. So the first question was uh, FCE for return to work. Uh, yeah, the FCE provides you with um, a, 
a fair bit of information because the the physio, the OT who's doing the FCE spends, fair, oh, I don't know whether it's an hour or two with them. Um, so it gives you a fair bit of objective information. As we said before, you know, you're matching that with your own information, your clinical diagnosis and commitment and motivation as well. But we wouldn't be using it in like every case that we do because it, it is one of those uh, interventions which, you know, you, if everyone who we were planning to return to work had an FCE, um, we wouldn't have enough providers doing it. It would, you know, the, the costs would escalate. So yes, for certain cases, we would certainly be doing FCEs, I suppose, uh, some of the more chronic um, conditions or ones where um, we're, we're struggling to understand sort of where they're at functionally. The other part of the question, just to remind me, is to do with Yep, it was, what is your experience with RTW for severe head injury PTS? Uh, can someone tell me what PTS is? Is it PTSD or PTS or? Um, they just wrote, PTS means patient, sorry. Oh, patient, sorry. Um, our experience, we, you, you find that not a lot of, it depends where the, the severe head injuries, I suppose, where they occur. In terms of the workers' comp thing, yes, we would um, be dealing with that as we would do with any particular injury. I know a lot of uh, other uh, severe head injuries occur through the uh, TAC system and, and the drivers for return to work in the TAC systems are a whole lot different to the, um, the workers' compensation system. So in the workers' compensation system, the employer uh, generally is on board with return to work and is strongly incentivized uh, to do that. Uh, as, a, as opposed to TAC where the employer has some incentives but isn't as strongly fiscally in, um, incentivized for the return to work. But as a, as a doctor, you would, it's within the patient's best interest to you know, return to their normal level of functioning at which return to work is part of it. So you, you would be advocating as much as you can, but it depends when you talk about head injury, you know, what level of function they're dealing with. And you're also looking at well, what, what's the nature of the roles and trying to match the two together. So someone's got quite a long question here, and I think this will be one of our last ones. Yesterday, we were wondering whether to refer a 55-year-old male patient to an occupational physician. He works as an Auslan language interpreter for a high school. His issues are cognitive decline, early dementia with behavioral issues, um, sexual phrases. The principal was not sure whether it is safe for him to continue his job. Is this an appropriate referral? Uh, it can be. Uh, so just read it out to me again. So I was... The, after the Auslan interpreter, high school, what were some of the issues again? Just tell me. So early dementia with yep. behavioural issues, sexual yeah. phrases. Okay. The, yeah, as an occupational physician, we get dealt, it's a bit like the general practitioner, you know, anything really comes in through the door. Uh, what happens in, I suppose, in the, in clinical practice is we, we tend to get sent predominantly things with more of a physical aspect to it. Uh, if it, there's any suggestion of a psychological condition, then it tends to go to a psychiatrist. Um, sometimes if there's a suggestion of a, uh, you know, cognition or things, sometimes we would then have to get neuropsych involved. But no, as a general principle, um, OC physicians would be dealing with really anything if there's a physical component to it. Thank you, Dr. Yong. Does okay. anyone have any more questions? We have two more minutes, so we could probably take one more. Well, I think that appears to be it. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Yong. That was a great presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, and I'll hand over to- Sorry, sorry, someone actually did drop a question in. What does your stand RTW plan look like? I assume that's standard RTW plan? That's what does standard return to work plan look like? 
Uh, well, you all standard talk- return to work plan, sorry. So if you're talking about a return to work plan, when we talk about it in Victoria, we have a, a particular document and the document would outline the, the individual worker, uh, their, their condition and restrictions and a planned return to work with hours of work and specific duties that they would do and some of those specific duties they wouldn't do. Uh, the key thing with the return to work plan is to get a uh, commitment from all parties. So at the bottom of the return to work plan is a worker saying they commit to it. Uh, they have their treating doctor, um, which could be to say like a rehabilitation physician or a GP, you could give even a, uh, was I not even, but it can be a physio. Uh, and then the employer. So you've got the three parties, um, the, the worker, the employer, and the treating team all committing to that plan. So that's what a return to work plan. So then everyone knows when that worker steps in the door, they're gonna be working X number of hours a day. They're gonna be doing these tasks, A, B, and C, and they're not gonna be doing D, E, F. And that's what a standard return to work plan tends to have. And then really that's a time dependent plan, which may go for, could be two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And then as you get to the end of that plan, then you drop another one and, and the general aim is with any of these plans, especially with a condition which is improving, is that there's going to be progression in the plan. So the hours and the next plan, you're aiming to increase. The duties, you're aiming to, again, increase the range. Again, dependent on their level of function and where they're at. But that's a sort of a standard way to approach a return to work plan. But the, the, the basic premise is you're getting multiple, all the parties committing to it. Because once, and as I said this before, if you don't get all three parties on board, it generally doesn't happen. The, the employer's not supporting, it doesn't happen. The worker doesn't support, it ain't happening. And if the doctor says no, definitely ain't happening. So that's the standard return to work plan. Thank you, Dr. Yong. Okay, thank you, Terence. I'll hand over to Sky and to Joe. So next we will have Dr. Joanne Bryant presenting. I know I do it all. Done. So either 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 is fine. Um, just make sure that you don't hit stop share because it will um, stop sending through to the other side. So I've just got a little reminder there for you. So what do I do? Just show me. I just just so click anywhere on here to advance. So where is it? Oh, yeah. Yep. And how do I go back? Um, this way here. Okay. Okay, we're ready to hand over to you, Terence, whenever you're ready. Thank you. I'll talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're ready for you for your presentation, Joanne. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm not a doctor. I'm an OT and um, I've been asked to uh, prepare this talk for you by the um, chair of the faculty training committee for rehab registrars. Um, I've uh, had the pleasure of sitting in and uh, hearing Dr. Yong's presentation. And um, I think what I, as an OT, as an occupational therapist, I'll be talking to you um, once workplace capacity has been established and the role that the OT has or the occupational rehab provider has in the process. So the aim of this session is to um, broaden your awareness of work capacity and restrictions, to look at return to work from the practical perspective of what of where we sit at as providers and as, a, uh, as OTs. Um, the promoting factors of sustainable return to work, when does it work and what predictors are they likely to be and some of the tips and tricks of the trade. 
which I um, hope you might find useful. Um, I'll talk about rehab intervention from prevention through to early return to work, um, vocational transition and placement. And I'll end with a um, just a short discussion about some of the work that I do in my forensic medico legal practice. A little bit about me, um, I graduated from Lincoln Institute in the 70s, um, so I've been doing rehab for some 40 years, I guess. I've worked in rehab in pain management, stress management, and then occupational rehab. Um, why people, I've always been very interested as to why people respond so differently to similar situations. I guess it's a perennial question, isn't it? And in 2011 and 2012, I um, completed a diploma in hypnotherapy, along with some extensive training with Dr. Michael Yapko, who's a worldwide leading authority in hypnosis and depression. I use this knowledge in my day-to-day -day work. It's been fascinating. Currently, I'm a non-executive director of a um, publicly listed high-tech company here in Melbourne, and I'm on the board of two not-for-profit organisations, um, organisations that provide um, services to people with mental health issues, brief line and outside the locker room. And I'm the director and manager of a small company co-work. Um, there's a small group of OTs, and we provide worksite assessments and forensic OT services to and vocational assessment evidence to the courts. Um, and I think over since 2008, I've pro probably prepared over a thousand of these reports. I've also had many years experience doing um, return to work with um, organisations like Australia Post, um, Department of Defence, ATO, um, and we've provided and I've provided training programs um, to promote best practice in biomechanics and to deliver employee health programs in the workplace. As an aside, I'm a parent of three adult kids. Um, my extended family consists of two sisters with profound disabilities. One sister has cerebral palsy with quadriplegic spasticity and um, the other sister has severe autism. So there's not much about disability that I don't think I have experienced in some way, shape or form. Both of my sisters would have loved the opportunity to work. A little bit about um, OT. Um, just so my background, I've been an OT for 40 years. Um, OTs are all about function and optimising personal, domestic, community and vocational independence. Um, OTs, I'm sure you've worked with OTs in the clinical setting, of course, in hospitals, but OTs work in um, paediatrics and general medicine, um, aged care, mental health. Um, assistive technology, OTs are in education and organisational change, and of course in OC rehab. Um, OTs are one who gets excited about things that no one else cares about. Is that true? Um, before I get down to business about return to work, I just want to show that, um, that there's nothing new about light duties and return to work. I took this picture when I was visiting Port Arthur, um, a couple of years ago, um, the invalid gang, convicts who were too sick to perform regular duties were placed in the invalid gang. These men worked at light tasks such as weeding and hoeing vegetable plots. I don't think they had the benefit of the support that's available to our workers today. So we all know what return to work is, right? Um, we also assume that all other stakeholders know that as well. Well, I think that's wrong. It cannot be assumed that everybody attaches the same meaning to work as we might. And in some, to some return to, and to some return to work may interfere with the concept that rest is equated to recovery. I just want to point out too that um, with an occupational physician where the, the role is to establish capacity, with an OT our role is once established, is, once capacity is established, um, our role is to then interpret that capacity and fit it to the workplace and to help and support the worker and the employer make sense of that and to facilitate a sustainable return to work. So return to work enables recovery from a work-related injury, potential to return to a normal life, to reduce the financial and emotional impact. And return to work may mean returning to an, the old job 
or finding or working in a new job. Um, these two slides are a reminder as to why this area of practice is time consuming, complex and potentially fraught. It is easy to see how the message can be lost in translation when there are so many stakeholders. Um, Dr. Yong did refer about uh, the employee and the employer. Um, in the workers' compensation arena, there are a few more stakeholders, but the employee and the employee's family and their social network are very important in supporting and encouraging and inspiring the um, worker to return to work. The employer obviously is that very um, important part of the of the processes uh, as been has been as has been pointed out. The owner, the manager, and the workmates are very important. If the work environment is not encouraging and welcoming, then an injured worker on a return to work is going to feel uncomfortable from the outset. The insurer and self-insurer, case manager, they're all keen stakeholders in the workers' compensation arena as part of the return to work process. And of course, the practitioners, the GP and the treating health professionals, which will be the psychologist or the physio or the um, exercise physiologist will sometimes be involved. The practitioners, the OC health physicians will be um, workers will be referred to them often through the uh, as through the insurer in the, again in the workers compensation arena the oc rehab providers and of course the regulators whether it's the state or the commonwealth okay um, i want to talk to you a little bit about uh, serious claims a serious claim is an accepted workers' compensation that results in a total absence from work of one full working week or more. It includes common law payments um, and it excludes compensated fatalities. Um, and serious claims in Australia, 104 in the year 2015-16, there are 104,770 serious claims Australian-wide. Of those, 90% were injury and musculoskeletal and 94,000 returned to work. 17% of those, of the 104,000, did not return to work in that year. So that's 17,000. By contrast, the um, just yeah, eighty six thousand returned to work. Seventeen percent didn't. Sorry, work. sorry, Joanne. Um, the people online just experienced a little difficulty hearing you. Oh, if I'm possible, sorry. could you just speak a tiny bit closer to the microphone? Sure. Is Thank that better? You. Is that better? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's no, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. So serious injury um, in the Victorian jurisdiction is uh, defined by the common law test um, or the common law and a serious injury certificate um, is granted. Now the narrative test um, is um, a different legislative de definition to the serious claim. Um, for the purposes of common law, a serious injury means any of the following. A permanent loss of um, bodily function of body function or impairment, permanent serious disfigurement, um, a permanent severe mental or a permanent severe behavioural disturbance or disorder, loss of fetus, and and or if a serious injury can also be defined as thirty percent or more whole per whole person impairment, which is established through the um, American Medical Association, Gu Association guides. So that's the narrative test and a serious injury um, is what I see mostly in my medico legal work where workers have um, had a serious injury um, confirmed and um, are then going through the courts. Okay, I hope that I'm, this is a bit easier to understand Terence. The principles of return to work. These next two slides define the core principles of return to work, which apply across all jurisdictions and all countries. The emphasis and incentives may change accordingly. Establishing the current work capacity is the baseline. 
Um, this happens through a medical professional, whether it's a GP, a physician, um, occupational physician, surgeon, um, but that's the core principle that all return to work is based from. A sustainable return to work can only be done effectively, in my view, when on site and with active and willing engagement from both the employer and employee, as Dominic alluded to. Disagreement can arise when the, um, the capacity, the current work capacity is opposing or poorly defined. GPs, for example, if a GP says or states that there's no work capacity and you have an independent medical exam um, saying that there is work capacity. Um, the primary goal of every return to work is for the worker to return to the same job with his, with his employer and hence the hierarchy. As I have previously referred to, the size and the, the, the size and sophistication of the business can be relevant. Um, small employers find it very expensive and often challenging to accommodate um, a worker for a long period of time on light duties, and we need to be sensitive to how we can manage and support and encourage a small employer. All employers, and particularly large businesses, um, so just sorry, the core, this core, going back to the core principles, the worker must be engaged um, and the employer has an obligation in Victoria for 12 months to continue to provide light duties. The treating health professionals, they're engaged by the agent, sometimes the employer and the um, provider is also engaged by the insurer. And if there's no current work capacity, the agent will continue to manage the, um, the will have a case manager will continue to manage the current, the, the worker whilst there is no current work capacity. Um, medical restrictions, I find my view is that they obviously form the basis of the return to work plan. Um, they must be simple, workable, realistic. Ta task modification beats task elimination every time if it can be achieved. How can a task in the workplace be modified um, so that the worker can perform part of that task if the employer is able to accommodate that? Must be able to justify reduced hours. Um, the return to work restrictions or the medical restrictions should be time framed and um, explain that restrictions will reduce as the worker progresses, as they, pro as they progress their rehabilitation and their recovery. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about restrictions and how um, I was working with a large food processing business that had a production um, processing line across three shifts. This is an example of a return to work with medical restrictions that need to be very mindful of the impact it can have in the workplace. Um, a worker presented with, uh, was diagnosed with a shoulder problem, bursitis, um, present, had an accepted claim and presented to work with a certificate saying that, uh, that she, was she was unable to lift using her dominant hand and um, and for duties, light duties to be found accordingly. The certificate also stated that uh, she was to work on day shift hours. This is some years ago, but it was a quite a, uh, an impactful experience for me because within a week of that certificate being um, forwarded um, to the employer, um, another four certificates and four workers came um, in with uh, a request to be on day shift hours. So we have to be very mindful that Restrictions are obvious to the to other workers. Um, it has to be seen that people gain neither disadvantage or advantage from being on a return to work plan, and that good communication is essential across the, across the, the, the scheme. So it is our responsibility as providers to be aware of the workplace culture and dynamics, analyse the situation, um, be aware of the be aware that it's important to educate and provide good communication and empathy. All parties benefit from being made aware of the potential consequences of their decisions. 
the potential for a light duties work for a light duties worker who doesn't want to be there or for other workers resenting the return to work plan in some circumstances can change a workplace culture for the worse and it is not uncommon in those situations for a site claim to follow. I'm painting a pretty grim picture, but, and it's not all like that, of course, but we just, just need to be very sensitive of the impact that a return to work can have in a, in a workplace. I want to have a quick look at the hierarchy that WorkSafe Victoria has adopted as a model that underpins the occupational rehab approach. The practical adoption of the hierarchy can be seen with the following case example. I have a 28 year old bricklayer with a year 11 education is earning $1,300 a week and has a two year history of occupational dermatitis that has become resistant to treatment. The decision has been made that he cannot return to bricklaying. Um, he's, it's the small employer of nine staff is unable to accommodate the worker in a different job. The worker is articulate and presents well. He's motivated by earning a good income and on discussion, a commission-based income based on performance was of interest to him. He has one investment property and about to buy a second and lives with his mum and dad. Option for this guy. Um, the Real Estate Institute of Victoria conduct a five-day course on it's called the agent's representative course for $800 or something. With this qualification and counselling in resume and interview preparation, this guy might be suited to an entry level job in real estate with an earning potential similar to his income as a bricklayer. Different employer, different job if we look at that hierarchy because he will not be going back to, um, it's been established that he won't be returning to work as a bricklayer. Second scenario that I can uh, describe is a 53-year-old bricklayer working for a large employer with year eight education earning $1,500 a week over six days with a lot of overtime. Three um, episodes of acute back pain, um, of, of, of acute onset of low back pain um, with time off work and returning to lighter duties on reduced hours that were very hard for the employer to accommodate after each workforce absence. Surgery was avoided and over-the-counter analgesia used as required. Excellent driving record, but this employer could no longer accommodate light duties. Medical restriction, restrictions stated that the worker was to avoid tasks that involved bending, lifting more than five kilos, twisting and standing and sitting for long periods. The worker wanted to stay in the construction industry. Option: help the uh, through the council through counselling arrange um, for the worker to undertake a medium rigid truck license at a cost of about um, eight nine hundred dollars, and help him find work driving a cement agitator truck, mostly short distance driving to be provided with education in techniques on how to enter and exit the cabin, avoid jumping to the ground and with the GP arrange core strengthening um, program to, to help and facilitate. Um, the estimated income of a truck driver is about $1,150 per week. So this is an example of a, a um, different employer, similar job, but um, enabling this older worker to stay connected to the construction industry. So an option like that is more likely to motivate him than to suggest perhaps process work in a factory or something that's indoors. This guy um, really wanted to be outdoors and remaining in the construction industry. So the hierarchy, as you can see, same employer, same job, same employer, similar job, um, and same employer, different job. Again, coming back to the size of the organisation will often determine how successful um, that hierarchy can be implemented. Um, again, in my medical legal work, we mostly see um, the situation where the um, employment with the original employer has been terminated or has finished and the worker is um, looking for or needing to find work with a different employer and often in a different job. A worker's vocational recovery may feel like this. The road to recovery is under construction. Um, 
the promoting factors for a sustainable um, return to work. A lot of this is very evident. I'm sure you'll be aware of it and uh, at the risk of uh, perhaps boring you, but employee-based guidance across all aspects of work rehabilitation is the, the promoting factor, the most important thing. If the empl employee, if the worker is not engaged, the return to work is going nowhere. It is imperative that the worker feels understood and is involved. Regardless of what I know about the situation, we're meeting a worker for the first time to plan their return to work. My opening line is usually something like, I hear you've had a bit of a hard time. It's an immediate icebreaker. The worker will talk to me about their experience and I actively listen in order to really understand. It's only when the worker feels understood in many instances that you can gain their confidence and trust to start talking about a return to work. People process information very differently and it can never be assumed that what is said is heard. For some workers, um, using pen and paper will, to explain con concepts or information is really helpful. Others check in by asking questions to ensure that, that the worker understands what is required of them and others. It is important that the worker, again, is made aware that the choices they make have consequences. All return to work and all occupational rehab must be time framed. Um, the number of times I've seen workers who just have been given a return to work plan, um, they've got their medical restrictions and they just assume that those medical restrictions will go on for months and months. And that's very difficult to change once that has been, once that's occurred. It's about managing expectations. I just want to give you a, um, a case, just a, an example of um, a worker or a person that was referred to me some years ago. She was a 55-year-old, petite, very petite, head of nursing with a troubling history of low back pain. Um, she was referred to me for a work site or workstation assessment. Um, she had been having physiotherapy, was on analgesia and had intermittent short periods of time off work. I went to the uh, workplace, um, met with her and um, observed her, her desk, her chair, everything was um, in good order. But as I was watching her sitting at her desk, um, I noticed that she was sitting forward in her chair with her lumbar spine in a very um, uncomfortable looking forward flexion position or posture. And she sat forward in the chair because her feet didn't touch the floor. It was only by sitting really forward and perching on the edge of the chair that her feet would touch the floor. So with a very simple um, modification piece of uh, equipment, which was a good quality footstool, a um, bit of education in postural biomechanics and um, made an immediate and long-term difference job done. So sometimes it can be the very, very obvious things that are easy to overlook but can make such a, such a difference. Another example I have is um, working with a lawyer who, again, I was asked to do a worksite assessment or workstation assessment, um, watching how she worked. Again, good desk, good chair, but whenever she was on the phone, she perched the um, receiver of the phone against her shoulder. And for neck pain, it was uh, a pretty... Um, it was just so obvious as to what had to happen. A good headset. Um, she, we had to try a few for her to find one that worked and, um, and a bit of physio. And the difference was, again, incredible. Sometimes it's the simple, easy things that make a difference. Um, promoting factors is in, integral to is effective communication and collaboration between all return to work parties. We've talked about communication for, before. Honest and open communication is just key. Providing information to people about their pathology, about typical outcomes and norms, and the expectations that the worker may have about recovery and work should be known and discussed. We need to understand what it is, that how that worker has processed what's happened to them. In all documentation, I also try to avoid using words and, and phrases that are potentially emotive. 
um, I replace struggle with does, you either do or you don't. Um, suffering with experience, injury with condition, difficulty with currently challenged, and pain with discomfort or symptoms. I'm probably sounding incredibly pedantic, but I think language makes, makes so much difference. And um, it's, it's important that we, um, it's part of the education that, um, that, that injury, injuries, conditions, pain, it doesn't have to go on indefinitely. It doesn't, it's not a permanent thing. And how we can help and support people, even by the use of language, can help. Some workers also need help about how to talk to their employer and their GP about restrictions and about their condition. A visit with the worker to the GP and workplace can keep the worker empowered. Discussion should be positive and focused on what the worker can do and not what the worker can't do. The other um, thing I wanted to share with you is how important narrative or story is. Um, story and telling, giving workers examples of um, people that have succeeded um, can help to educate, to inform, inspire and help prepare them for change if necessary. The work of uh, James Pennybaker is really interesting here and I find both story and narrative and writing is a technique that for some people can provide an enormous amount of insight and helps to separate the emotion from the underlying issues, if there are any, of a work-related condition. Um, so the employee is, the, is an, obviously the most promoting factor of a sustainable return to work. And looking for the evidence of intrinsic motivation, is this a person that is able to drive themselves, motivate themselves? Do they rely on external motivators? Um, that helps, under, if we understand that, that helps us to give us a um, foundation on how to relate to the person. A supportive work environment is obviously another promoting factor that is critical to successful and sustainable return to work. Um, a sense of belonging. If the worker feels that they belong, um, then that is a really imperative and important part of, um, of them of wanting to go back to work. Um, there's been a lot of work in the educational, in educational research that I think can be applied here as well. And um, there's lots of things that we can do in, um, in helping to promote or to encourage the employer into keeping the worker connected to the workplace. Things like inviting them to social events when they're off work, continuing to invite them if there are any social events that um, are held at the workplace. Telephoning and sending them a get well card if they're recovering from surgery. Um, for workers to feel that they're genuinely welcomed back to the workplace. And I find another really helpful technique is to um, team them up with a buddy when the return to work starts. Um, that buddy can sometimes be that buffer or that bouncing, um, able to bounce off ideas or thoughts or concerns that they might have. So um, the predictor um, of, this, of, inter, of somebody who's intrinsically motivated and who has a sense of belonging, a strong sense of belonging to the workplace, in my experience, um, those people do very, very well. Those workers do very well. Stimulating social environment um, probably just speaks for itself in some ways, but a worker who um, has a good social network, a good, a good family or good group of friends makes a big difference as to whether their return to work is successful. In my work at Griefline, where um, I, I'm on the, the board of it, it's a not-for-profit organisation, we will get calls from people who perhaps finish work, finish work on a Friday, they speak to no one until they go back to work on Monday. They have nobody in their lives. They live alone, people who live alone, who for whatever reason or circumstance have, um, have uh, no family, perhaps in the city that they're living, um, few friends, have, find it difficult to make friends. When work 
is um, if they're not going to work, then they become incredibly isolated. They have really lack social support. Sometimes, sometimes the treatment that they have for their um, work-related condition can um, be the only contact these people have and it acts as a secondary motivator because they're able to go to physio, go to hydrotherapy, and that's where they meet and talk to people. We need to again be aware of um, what social stru stru constructs and structures are around to support, help and, um, our workers. The evidence is conclusive that people with little or no social support have poor outcomes. Perception is everything. In life, if life was fair, I'd have everything because I work so hard. If life was fair, I'd have everything because I'm such a good person. Um, not for a second do I think with this slide that all workers feign illness. And as Dr. Yong referred to um, earlier, malingering is an out-of-date concept and we don't use that terminology. However, um, people are... Perception is everything. Elmer doesn't want to go to school today, so he feigns illness by putting spots on his face. His superhero mother doesn't know a thing about being sick, so she panics. Soon, the school, the hospital, and all the town is in a panic from Elmer, Elmer's fake illness. I just uh, recall um, in 2002, I think it was, short, it was after 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center, um, the Virgin counter check-in counter at Tullamarine Airport, passengers were checking in when one passenger noticed or commented on a strange odour. Within a short space of time, panic had set in. People were passengers were collapsing, screaming. Um, the counter was shut down. Personnel um, were called in. People were transport, passengers were transported, ambulance transported to hospital. Over the next two or three days, um, intensive investigations at the airport to find the cause of the odour proved that nothing could be proven um, and, there were in, and there was no um, explanation for that. Um, so the, the effect of contagion, I think, is um, rare, but it certainly exists. And I have a second example of that when I um, first... Um, was working in Ockery Rehab in the 90s with the RSI epidemic in uh, Australia, the so-called RSI epidemic. I would frequently see workers coming to for return to work and, and uh, complaining of musculoskeletal disorders, arm pain, shoulder pain, back pain. We'd have three or four workers from the same department in the same company. And the power of suggestion is so... Um, it's, so pow it's just so powerful. And where workers have, um, where people have a degree of uncertainty, um, perhaps anxious, um, suggestion is a very, um, we need to be very careful and be very aware of what, what people are told and uh, how we interpret that and how we support people through it. the profound disability of being disabled. Um, in the, our medico legal work, we see workers have been job detached for three, four, five, six years. Um, their workers' comp payments may have stopped some years earlier. Um, they're reliant on income from Centrelink, um, from their spouse or from their superannuation payments. Adjournments, conciliations, legal appointments, independent medico legal assessments, they all contribute to the cost of um, poor, just, just poor outcomes, mental health issues, financial distress, sleep disturbance, loss of social support, weight gain is very common with people who've been job detached for a long time, loss of confidence, skill erosion, passivity, resentment, perceived injustice all far worse than the original injury problem. Litigation just adds another level of complexity and distress with a focus on what people can't do and with the process taking much longer than what was expected. 
So the collateral damage is, um, as I've said, weight gain, becoming deconditioned, depression, anxiety, resentment, perceived injustice, anger, financial distress, relationship breakdown. We must do everything we can to avoid long-term um, job detachment. If only daytime TV addiction was the only problem. I was on workers' compensation for 18 months to recover from a job injury. After that, I had to go to rehab to cure my addiction to daytime TV. I want to talk to you a little bit about the river of well-being. This is work from um, Dr. Dan Siegel, a psychiatrist, child psychiatrist at the US. Um, I, this, his work, this book, is an excellent book and I think should be compulsory reading for all parents. Again, there are concepts and uh, a model in here that I think applies across the lifespan. And I don't think it's a very good picture, but um, you can see a boat in the middle of a river of well-being that Dr. Siegel refers to as a river of well-being. On one side is the bank of chaos, and on the other side is the bank of rigidity. And as we go through life, we uh, come across obstacles. That's the nature of being human, I guess. Um, it's life's not all about just flowing smoothly. We have uh, hurdles thrown at us all along the way. And uh, we have a couple of different ways of dealing with it. Um, people who are flexible and adaptable and can figure out and, and work their way through these obstacles. Um, we tend, people tend to um, move to the bank of chaos, which is where the future thinking style, the, the, the thinking style is in the future. And that's really where anxiety lives. What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, uh, the what if questions. The other side of the, of the river is the bank of rigidity, which is a thinking style that's in the past. And that's where depression lies. It's the, they're the people who pull the doona over their head in the mornings and don't want to face the world. And if only I hadn't done this, and if only I hadn't done that, or if only the, um, my employer hadn't um, put in that new machine and whatever. So I think it's a really useful model to think about how people might be processing um, the, the, the situation and the events that are happening to them. And uh, I really commend this book to you. It's uh, Dan Siegel's work is wonderful. And the river of well-being, um, I often use this diagram when I'm working with people to just explain how we think um, determines often how we, well, it does, determine how we feel and then determines how we behave. So what we think is how we feel, is how we behave. And we have, um, as a therapist, we have a, uh, one of our roles is to try and provide people with that insight and to challenge their way of how they think, which of course is the basis of CBT. Um, we have a forever changing workforce. We need to uh, help workers to expect and help people to expect the unexpected. Flexibility equals work. Um, we need to encourage people to be flexible in um, how they approach their um, workplace, how they approach looking for new jobs, if that's what they uh, need to do, if they're unable, like a bricklayer who, um, with occupational dermatitis, who could not go back to bricklaying, what else can he do from a um, skill set, from from his expectation for remuneration, but by being flexible and adaptable is um, where he's most likely and where people are most likely to succeed. I want you to find a bold and innovative way to do exactly the same thing in the way it's been done for 25 years. The world of work and the world we live in is changing at such a fast pace. Fast pace. I don't need, you don't need me to tell you that. So some of the key concepts of today is to never underestimate human potential, engage your worker, your patient, task modification beats task elimination all the time, be positive, educate, communicate, and understand employers from their point of view. It's 
particularly the small employers who don't have the resources of a HR manager or a dedicated team and um, who are often still working very long hours and then accommodating um, somebody on light duty as they don't have the knowledge or the information to understand the medical um, consequences of that and what's happening and they need a lot of support in my opinion and in my experience to help make this return to work um, successful and sustainable. So in closing, I just couldn't resist. And thank you for listening. Are you there, Terence? And if any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Few people online saying thank you for your presentation. Thank you. But it appears no one has no any questions? questions. Perfect, that's fine. Um, well, I guess that concludes today's session for the BNTP. Thank you so much for your time coming in to present. You're welcome. Thank you, Terence. Thank you, everyone. Before you leave,